I have learned nothing new this week. Nothing, not one thing, because my head has been down in my lap thinking about Avengers Endgame. So I've thought up a little game for us to start playing. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go to Wikipedia, and I'm gonna go to the left side of Wikipedia, or right if you're backwards. I'm gonna click the random article link, and I'm going to try to find something sciencey in it to make fun. Ha, <laughs> I learn a little bit, you learn a little bit, it probably won't go wrong. Random. So live at the Olympic, the last DJ was a Tom Petty in the Heartbreakers album, and breaking hearts is actually a real medical condition. It is called Takosubo cardiomyopathy, and it's the broken heart syndrome, which you may have heard about in the news recently, unfortunately, but it is a real thing where extreme emotion can trigger some kind of heart failure, and then uh, you don't make it, and then you'd really be free, free fallen into death. <laughs> wow, this is going good. Random. The Pisholm Glen Tree Trail in England is home to many rare and unusual trees. You know what's kind of unusual about trees? <laughs> Run into the woods and then look up. And what you'll see is what's called crown shyness. It looks weird. It's a very unusual property for trees, at least from our perspective. You look up and the tops of the trees where the leaves would be meshing with each other because all the trees next to each other, there's actually a separation between each tree's canopy. And you can see it as like little lines in the, in the canopy as you look up as light is coming through. They don't completely overlap. And we think this is because as they compete for resources, they kind of interfere with each each other and naturally stop growing right next to the interface of where those trees would be. That was interesting, right? Random! Ferruginous? What is ferruginous? That's a cool word. Stegastozygotoma is a moth and it is marked by deep ferruginous bronze, slightly whitish sprinkled wings. Ferruginous means it has the appearance of a dark bronze, an irony rusty color. And it sounds like something that went wrong with your food. Got all ferruginous. Anyway, I learned a new word. Hello and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections, count them, and I try to capture them with an ultra ball of science with the hopes of... And then I tell you what's going up next on this channel. Hint, it is the longest episode of Because Science I have ever done in the entirety of the show. You can guess what it's about. But getting right into it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are trying to figure out how to make a Mewtwo for real. In a nutshell, which could be a weird Pokemon, this is what I came up with. <laughs> if you want a 15 minute longer answer, watch the episode. But what did you have to say? Our first comment, and it's an important one, comes from Christ Reithus, who says, Wouldn't it be easier to apply genetic splicing to the zygote or the embryo before triggering its mitosis and its dividing instead of applying it to the full-grown Pokemon, or is it not possible to do that? Okay, so what Christ is getting at here is a very important point. In our diagram in the episode, I was saying that after you birth a clone of Mew, then you would start doing genetic experimentation on it. You would take some of Mew's cells and then insert transgenic genes into those cells, reintroduce them into the already born Mewtwo, and then hopefully the Mewtwo will express those genes and become super powerful. But it should be said that the most common way to make so-called transgenic animals, like a kitten that glows in the dark, we've done that, is to insert these foreign genes into the embryos before they were born. So in this interpretation, we would create this foreign DNA from strong Pokemon that we wanted to uh, have in Mewtwo, and then we would insert those genes into the embryo that would go into the original Mew and then be birthed as the fully grown tube kangaroo, as we put it. My approach of taking cells out of Mewtwo, modifying them, and then reintroducing them is a form of gene therapy. We do this to people. We take people's cells who are suffering from some genetic disease or anomaly, correct for the genetic deficiencies in those cells, and we reintroduce them with the hopes that the right proteins are created that it deals with the disease. So I'm combining a couple of different genetic technologies here. The reason why I did that is because in the Pokemon uh, media, in the Pokemon Mansion journal entries, it makes it seem as though 
though Mewtwo is being experimented on before it becomes full Mewtwo. For example, in uh, Pokemon Fire Red, the Pokedex entry is Mewtwo, a Pokemon whose genetic code was repeatedly recombined for research. It turned vicious as a result. So to me, that implies that Mewtwo was born and then experimented on to become the vicious beast that it was made to be. So that would be more of a gene therapy approach. But you are right, Chris. the most common way to make a transgenic animal is to modify the embryo before a Mewtwo is even born. That is another way of doing it, but we went the other way around because I was trying to fit within Pokemon canon as best I could. This sounded like a correction. Oh well! Our next comment comes from a Mr. Bjorkegren and Bob Duncan Vivo and Harry Candine. <laughs> Among other commenters who say something like this, Hey Kyle, you suck as a Pokemon trainer because you didn't pick powerful enough Pokemon. What are you doing? Wouldn't you want to pick stronger Pokemon, take their genes and put them into Mewtwo? Look, yes, Staryu and Vaporeon and Kadabra are not the most powerful Pokemon. The reason I picked them is because I was going with Mewtwo's moveset in red and blue specifically. I went with some of my favorite Pokemon with those moves and took their genes, so to speak, so that Mewtwo would have that moveset in theory. I know you could have picked someone like Alakazam or Solarion or whatever, or that Steel Bird, but I didn't pick the most powerful Pokemon objectively because I was trying to create the actual move set for Mewtwo and this has nothing to do with any sciencey thing so let's move on. Reaperfolk underscore 12 says well you can only have one Mewtwo after him you'd get a Mew 3 and a Mew 4. I guess that's right if you were doing the alternate way of uh, modifying an embryo putting it in Mew and then birthing it and then seeing if that's a powerful enough monster and then doing it again you wouldn't have Mew 2 anymore you'd have Mew 3 and Mew 4 so maybe our interpretation is correct. Maybe. I also like the idea of Mew 3 and Mew 4 because it reminds me of like Lady 3 Jane from Neuromancer, who is a clone of an original Jane. So she's 3 Jane, and I love, I love, you should read Neuromancer if you haven't read it. Our next comment comes from Philip Dyer, who says, explain missing no with science. <laughs> and then makes this face. <laughs> okay, so here's what you do. If you want to create a missing no with science, off the top of my head, from 20 years ago, here's what you want to do if you want to create missing no with science. First, you fly to Viridian City. You talk to an old man who teaches you how to catch a Caterpie with a Pokeball. You immediately fly to the city where the Pokemon Safari Zone is. From that Pokemon place, then you walk right down to the edge of the beach, and then you get on a Pokemon that has Surf. From there, you go all the way down the edge of the map until you are on the very edge of the Seafoam Islands where you can find Articuno. And then, if you go up and down searching for random encounters enough, uh, then eventually you will find Missing No. And this is exactly how science explains it. So, if you want it... But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Navycation, who says, you've mentioned gene splicing is extremely unlikely to work and only has a small chance to actually produce a stable creature which would function properly. Well, in our interpretation of making uh, Mew into a tube kangaroo. This goes hand in hand with the theory. It's a fan theory. Often said, a lot of you said in the comments, that Ditto is most likely a failed clone of Mew. The evidence is undeniable. Navication says, first, they're both pink. Off to a great start. Secondly, Mew is the only Pokemon in the game who can learn every single move, and Ditto, through Transform, can also kind of learn every single move. Thirdly, only two Pokemon in the original games have perfectly balanced stats, Mew with 100 across the board, and Ditto with a 48 all across the board. So less than half of Mew's kind of like a failed clone? And the biggest piece of evidence? Where's the only place you can find Ditto? In Pokemon Yellow. <laughs> That's right, in the Pokemon Mansion and in the cave where Mewtwo resides. Oh, it's undeniable now and has obviously been thought out. Also, Ditto looks like a failed clone attempt, just a blob of goo. So there you have it. Navication, just like many fan theorists before he, she, them, have perfectly outlined why Ditto is in fact a failed clone of Mew. It has almost nothing to do with what we're talking about, although we'll get to some of your corrections about Ditto. But for all of this navigation, you are indeed a super nerd. Uh, transform! But of course, I'm not always right. I had no idea what was in mayonnaise. It's just eggs and vinegar and stuff. I thought it was like all fat. So what did I get wrong last week? All right, you nerds. The biggest correction is definitely from Frankie Stein and a bunch of other people who all say, when I punched a Zubat with my fist, a fighting type moves like a punch 
would not be super effective against a Zubat, as I said. Come on. Are you kidding me? I'm level 100. I'm rare candying up from head to tippy toe. I'm at the top of the mountain and only halfway up. You know what I'm talking about? My stats are off the charts, especially a special. When I hit that Zubat, do you know what happened? Ooh, I hit it with a fist that feels like solid rock. And do you know what Zubats are weak to? That's right, rock type moves. Come on. A couple of you, like Infinite Asim, Frequent Commenter, and Weeman Boy, say you don't even need Ditto because it's either a failed clone of Mew or Mew might already have all of the genes of all Pokemon inside of it, so you do not need Ditto as a vector. A vector, of course, being something like a little genetic vessel that you could take genes from outside of an organism, put it into this little genetic vessel, and then insert it into the other organism or embryo or what have you. If you agree with my approach that genes are being inserted into the cells of either Mew or Mew2, and you are doing gene splicing specifically, then you still do need a vector, some way to get those bits of DNA fragments into the organism, either at a blastocyst stage or at full grown stage with the more gene therapy approach, as I said in the episode. You don't need a ditto to do that. I think I may have inadvertently made a mistake here because I was thinking of transform, I picked ditto. I was not aware of the very popular fan theory that ditto is a failed clone of Mew. This is just coincidentally wrong. I wasn't trying to canonically connect the two. I was just saying, oh, this Pokemon transforms a lot, so maybe it could serve as a good vector because it has a lot of variability in its genes, maybe. It could have been anything. It could have been some more bacteria-like Pokemon, and we took its cells and we used that as a vector. Ditto doesn't really matter, although it's pretty fun to look at in the face. Chat and poet Enrico Ludwig and Justin Dahl and others say you don't even need to splice any DNA into Mew or its cells or embryos or what have you because Mew might have all of the genes from all Pokemon already residing inside of its DNA. Yes, it's a very cool fact about Mew. However, because they mention in all the Pokemon media gene splicing specifically, that specifically means taking genes from outside of the organism and inserting it into to an embryo or a full-grown organism to make that organism or parts of it or parts of its tissues transgenic. So you wouldn't use just the organism itself as you are saying. However, this does lead us directly into our super nerd comment of the week. And I am giving that accolade to Venebra, who says something very interesting about what actually, actually might be going on. And he, she, they say it could be more of an epigenetic thing. So if Mew already has all the genes of all Pokemon residing inside of it, then you could use something called epigenetics to turn it into something like our armored tube kangaroo. Epigenetics is the scientific field of study where we are trying to go into the genome of animals, uh, the DNA, and use little scientific tricks I'll say, and turn off and turn on certain genes in the DNA, kind of like flicking on and off a light switch. There is a lot of epigenetic hype around potentially turning one creature into another by going into its genes and seeing which of them are maybe turned off that you could turn on and make it express different proteins and turn it into something else. If you've ever heard of the Chickenosaurus, that's scientists trying to go into the genome of birds or chickens, flick certain switches on and off, and have them re-express more dinosaurian genes that have been deactivated over the intervening millions of years after uh, non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. And in chicken embryos, I believe, they've been able to uh, make them express teeth and not beaks. So you can see the chain of reasoning here. You can see how you could take a mu embryo, maybe epigenetically turn off certain switches, flick on other ones, and then have it be born as something more like a Mewtwo. Venebrae goes on to speculate, wait, is this what TMs and HMs are all doing, going into the genome of a Pokemon and having it express certain genes that would give it a certain kind of move or move set? That would be very interesting. It doesn't really fit with the gene splicing we are trying to get in the episode, but if all this Mew has all gene stuff and all this gene splicing Mewtwo stuff is all in the same canon, I guess we can speculate about all of it and learn a little something as we do so. So for getting us to think about all of that stuff and the different ways this could work out, Venebrae, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Now, on to the next episode of Because Science. In what will be the longest episode I've ever done for this show ever, we are going into the quantum mechanics for time travel to sort out the timeline 
for Avengers Endgame. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, in an episode I've thought harder about than any episode on this show in years, we are trying to sort out time travel, timelines, histories, what actually happened in Avengers Endgame. Many of you have asked about this on social media and people have been talking about it. It was the first thing I was thinking about when I was watching the film. I didn't know it would take me so long to put together, but I think we finally did it. What is time travel? How could we possibly do it? What is theoretically possible? What is quantum mechanics and how does it fit into time travel? And what is who, when, where, how that? I think we get it all straightened out. Maybe. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet, all about Mewtwo and how to make it if you want to be a science monster. And leave me your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Many of you who are frequent commenters know that I actually do try to read most of the comments on all of the videos within the first five to six hours of it publishing. And all of you who post weird comments, I do read them. So get in there, get nerdy, and maybe you'll show up on this show. Look, Ma, I'm famous for however long this video will be. Oh, and don't forget, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I left my original Pokemon Red cartridge on a plane in the back uh, of the seat in a Game Boy Color, it was silver, and it didn't have the back on it, the batteries were exposed, and I had a Mew on it. If you found this Game Boy with my original Pokemon Red from my childhood, please send it back to me. I was so sad.